Okay, here we go. McAfee wants to protect your Galaxy S8. How necessary is virus software on a phone? We'll take a closer look at the leaked OnePlus 5 concept sketches and what's the buzz on Google's Fuchsia project? Are we looking at the next generation of Android? Make sure you're charged and ready for episode 252 of the Pocket Now Weekly. Coming at you May 11th at around 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, of course, because we're out, I'm out here on the West Coast. This weekly podcast is where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile. Smartphones, tablets, and wearables, it's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid, and fuchsia was a color I was never cool enough to pull off. I'm still not cool enough to ever wear fuchsia. Uh, I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, senior editor at PocketNow.com, blasting this signal from sunny Southern California. Actually, not so sunny this week. We've got some weather coming in. And joined uh, via remote patch, we're trying something a little different with this week's podcast because uh, plucky podcast producer Jules Wong is out on the East Coast, but he's doing a little traveling. How's it going out there, buddy boy? Hey, hey, I'm in Brooklyn uh, for some uh, interesting podcasting going on as well. Uh, it's sort of related to art industry, uh, but yeah, just uh, here on um, quote unquote business. Quote unquote business, uh, business he cannot rightfully tell you about at the moment, lest he have to kill you. I mean, it's. I mean, it does involve uh, murder and <laughs> treachery and the mob. So <laughs> I'd be like, uh, season know. two of S Town. <laughs> well, you're close enough. It's crime town. Crime so, town. Uh, that, oh. that's, what dis- that's what they're discussing. Oh, uh, poor at, Brooklyn. Uh, for some reason, Brooklyn straight they're, up. They're in Brooklyn. <laughs> they just went to Brooklyn. You just you I, I like please send all of your hate mail to uh, Jules uh, Jules Wong at PocketNow.com. But, but that but yeah that's that's literally like the Gimlet's having a discussion here and I was like yeah we're just gonna do it in Brooklyn I don't know why they decide <laughs> to uh, hold it not in Providence where, you right know, where the actual right, right, right. show was held and. You know, well, and, I mean, and and also just for for our show right now too, we're trying something a little different because of this remote patch, and and if it works, maybe we'll have a new format for the uh, for the Pocket Now Weekly. I'm I am not good for now and forever. I, I'm not good at running this thing live. I'll, I'll just say that right. I mean, like I'm super stressed out about putting all these pieces together. Uh, but before we jump into some uh, some some news topics and some other fun conversation and chat, uh, Mr. Wong, would you be so kind as to uh, detail for our listeners and our viewers how they can get in contact with us for the show? Yeah, that's a pretty easy detail. If you want to talk to us and get some questions in for us to answer at some point sooner or later, you can do so at podcast at pocketnow.com. That's the email that you should be uh, sending it to. And uh, if you prefer to be more instant, more social, more, I don't know, using less characters, <laughs> uh, you can use the hashtag PN Weekly, wherever hashtags are accepted. Uh, yes, uh, membership has its privileges. So uh, that's how you can get in contact with us for the show. We are going through those emails. I mean, one of the things that takes some of the fun out of producing the show is not having that sort of live instant chat happening with you guys and gals. And so yeah. uh, we are collecting your emails and your questions, and we're putting together uh, a, a listener take the wheel uh, podcast. Hopefully for when we can get back to live streaming these things, I think we're another good step in the right direction for making that happen. So hopefully in the next couple episodes, we'll have a system that you, we can engage directly with you fine folks again. That's enough BTS on the uh, the Pocket Now that, Weekly. That's one small step for a podcast and one giant leap <laughs> for, for pod- podcasting kind. kind. Um, yes, except for all of the other shows that are doing this way better than we are ATM. Um, oh, yeah. So oh, yeah, right. <laughs> let's let's jump into some some news here, uh, uh, Mr. Wong. I, I've got us all queued up for for your uh, your top stories from PocketNow.com. Oh boy! And uh, if boy, you can, we got we got the stories. We got the rundown. Yeah, the so, full rundown, um, the full you, scoop, you know? the the four one one. Let's. let's... <laughs> Uh, or the, or the four or five, and uh, that's a nightmare. So uh, let's not think no, about let's that, not. and let's get into it. Uh, the Uncarrier may be showing off some of its rebel ways with word that T-Mobile is coming up with a TCL-made Ooh. phone, or three. They will be branded as Revel, that's R-E-V-V-L, 
with differentiating, uh, differentiating models likely being called T1, T2, and T3. At least one of them is expected to strike the mid-range in specifications, but we don't have pricing details. Rumors go on to say that T-Mobile will guarantee warranty and insurance for the life of the device, nice. which may de uh, debut in the summer. Summer in Mexico just got a little more interesting. Smartphone geeks will not be tanning at the beach, uh, beaches of Cancun, but looking to Best Buy, yes, they do have Best Buys over there, as well as Sam's Clubs, and Couple for a Xiaomi phone. The Redmi Note 4 is expected to go up at brick and mortars, as well as some online shops, for about 5,500 pesos, just short of $300. The Redmi Note 4X may also come into play as well. In an interview with The Verge, an engineer uh, on the Microsoft Surface team said that USB-C was not included on the Surface laptop because of charging concerns. The recently released laptop instead comes with a Surface Connect port with a closed system of adapters and accessories, but with all the different sorts of USB spec that are on many of the Type-C cables out there, the main reason why the connector was dropped was worry that consumers would blame Microsoft if they used a third-party cable and their device suddenly shut down while plugged in. If you only barely tolerate AVG or look at security because they're not too offensively oppressing and you can't bother to uninstall the preloaded apps, McAfee protection is sure to give such apps a bad rap. Samsung has a deal with McAfee to preload its suite to all Galaxy S8 and Galaxy S8 Plus devices. You can get three uh, a free 60-day trial of Live Safe or Live Safe or Live Safe depends on how you spell <laughs> Live. Um, and a quote uh, special offer after that. And if you don't know who John McAfee is, you're better off. Finally, selfie-obsessed Chinese company May Too has something special for Woo! you. No, not you. Woo! In China. <laughs> and no, not a Hello Kitty phone. They've already done that. It's a, sm a Sailor Moon phone. <laughs> a limited edition device packaged in a giant pink box. And of course, if you're Sailor Moon, you need a wand. A selfie wand. 10,000 units are going up for grabs, though I'm assured some of you are glad your arms don't reach that far. What do you think? <laughs> I, uh, you know, Sailor Moon was a show that I kind of watched when I was in college a little bit, not too much. That, well, I, I mean, know that you're more of this card captor Satra type. So. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, like I, I could pivot if I could pivot my webcam easily. I could show you the, the scroll of Vegeta that I keep oh, up Vegeta, all the time. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess what's just kind of interesting is their their idea of accessorizing. So, you know, the whole branding and the pink and the Sailor Moon and all that stuff obviously isn't really quite my jam how I use phones these days, but the notion of having kind of branded accessories like this wand that we've yeah. got up on the screen right now, that's actually kind of a smart idea that I think would be really cool to expand into other devices. Like, if I really wanted to let my geek flag fly and having a proper, you know, like, Fallout-themed phone would be really rad with the world of gadgetry that we have in Fallout and actual first-party accessories that kind of play into that aesthetic. Mm -hmm. not, not just, like, that Pip-Boy one-off collector's oh, yeah. edition thing, but, like, a Pip-Boy smartwatch. A specifically Pip -Boy built... everything. Nuka yeah, Cola, exactly. Just spill Nuka-Cola. It's charged with Nuka-Cola. Like it's charged you just put with Nuka-Cola. <laughs> How many caps did that cost you, man? That looks expensive. <laughs> I don't even get me started about that. But are you... Maybe maybe, you should, maybe we should just change it to like an Ev Evangelion um, phone. Like what Sharp yeah. did for its 20th anniversary thing. Yeah. That was a Robotech. thing as well. I, I mean, like even something silly, like I, I could, I could maybe be persuaded to rock some uh, Vampire Hunter D uh, accessories. Mm. I, I don't know what that would look like—a <laughs> wooden stake that also doubles I, yeah. as like a Bluetooth handset or something like that. I, it's or at that point, potential. you might as well just go more mainstream and and stick with <laughs> Castlevania. You know? Right. Although you know what? Like, what's funny is I was not—I was never a huge Castlevania fan. 
Um, oh. You know, I, 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 got, I got drawn into anime way too young because of Vampire Hunter D. You see this cartoon, and it looks kind of dark oh, and edgy, okay. and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And I probably watched it a little younger than I probably should have. Um, but I wanted to circle to this other topic. I mean, getting back, I and mean, we don't talk a lot about laptops and, mm. you know, that kind of gear. But I wanted to get your thoughts, Jules, on this reasoning from Microsoft about USB-C being consumer confusing, being kind of a hassle, and instead their reply being a proprietary piece of hardware, kind of dongle-rific, iPhone style. Um, where do you think this is going to land? I'm really lukewarm on the Surface Laptop, personally. And I don't know where you're at with the Surface Laptop, but I I do have some issues with the way that Microsoft has gone about not only building this machine, but then also explaining some of the choices that they've made. I mean, like every so often when we talk about this this or that Microsoft event, we've noticed how, you know, uh, they've become more Apple-ish in terms of presenting its uh, its products, its hardware, and in terms of framing this product especially, when you have a clear analog to just the regular MacBooks, uh, there's definitely something uh, going on when it comes to making the compromise for design. Uh, one of the biggest issues was design and, and thinness for the engineer, but uh, in terms of... Uh, Implementing uh, just the Surface Connect port. I mean, it's, it's a decent mm-hmm. port. It's magnetic. It's it's fine. It's okay. Uh, but in terms of uh, blaming, I think my favorite uh, go-to phrase now is in terms of. Uh, <laughs> but um, how should I say this? All right. So when we're talking about uh, Type C, we have all mm-hmm. these as experts. Google has its Benson Lung, and then there's a whole department of, you know, people that go do compliance work on that and are very vocal advocates. And we've seen the spread from uh, Android manufacturers to Apple on its laptop side. Not sure on the mobile side just yet, but Microsoft seems to be still, I mean, it's allowing its OEM partners who are making... Uh, convertible laptops, uh, convertible tablets, to utilize uh, USB, even Thunderbolt too. Right. So, in, well, if so I mean, like, to... if if this if this argument is we've we're worried about consumers being confused. Since I I got on the Thunderbolt three train early, I really feel like there's an opportunity here for a manufacturer who's looking to put out a premium device like the like this surface laptop to start a standard or to start a trend like apple has where maybe we only use USB-C on the peripherals and on portable devices like phones and then all computers are going to start licensing thunderbolt so that it doesn't matter what direction you're plugging things into you know and if we all just agreed on thunderbolt yeah. cabling and the host computers for these for for you know like your desktop or your laptop is still probably your productivity hub or your center your brain your mobile on the go solution doesn't need to have thunderbolt obviously so we could set the standard there and i think that would clear up a lot of this consumer confusion and i Microsoft don't would know be the company that a to proprietary do it port it's not necessarily a sales leader it's a standard bearer for new verticals although right it's this is not really a new vertical you could say, but it's something that delivers Windows 10 S. Um, right. You could say that you know does that, but still, you would have to. Say, they have to realize at some point that it's it's a firm piece of hardware that they're doing, and they're showing it off, and they're and they're bragging about it to students. You, you're you're too late at this point. The <laughs> USB C. This this was the time. This was the time to convert. This was the time to right. make sure that you had your uh, manufacturing lines all in place and being very clear, very educated about this. Um, very you have a you have a very proactive audience. If you're talking about youth, right. they should know. So. 
I think that's a absolvement of responsibility on Microsoft's part to um, take control of this situation. Now, I, I just I just wonder though, what what with the backlash that Apple received over Dongle Gate, uh, that oh <laughs> you, these USB C ports and these Thunderbolt ports mean I have to use all these dongles, and you know, I, to a degree, I mean I understand the frustration, and I really do wish that more professional grade professional air quotes grade laptops had say SD card readers built into them for all of the creative professionals out there that are shooting content. Keep saying but, that Surface Connect port is a, is a, like an SD card slot. It's not. It's, it's stupid. Yeah. I, see, that's that's the problem that I'm running into is I can totally appreciate an engineering concern over consumer confusion, but a solution which involves dongles and proprietary hardware I find to be... I, I don't even know what word I want to use there because I, I want to throw out something like disingenuous, but that's not the right word. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's it's a solution that I don't think people are going to be very happy about. One USB port, a display port, which I, I don't know in my in my a circle mini of display port, <laughs> family and friends. That's not a cable standard that anyone ever really embraced. Even over a few of my friends who have gear that uses like micro HDMI. I understand the advantages, pros and cons between HDMI and DisplayPort, but um, that wasn't something that was ever really sort of popularized in my sphere, in my in my yeah. sort of circle of influence. So again, it, it's just sort of an, I, I find this to be some odd decisions. And I worry that because the Surface Pro has been as successful a line of of uh, convertibles as it has been, that now they're just sort of taking a couple other stabs at other things that they can try using the Surface name to try and drum up some interest. And this doesn't really feel like a well thought out ecosystem approach to hardware, which I shouldn't be surprised because I don't know that Microsoft has ever had a really great ecosystem approach to hardware outside of the Xbox. Uh, it's it, uh, part of, you know, throwing your, your weight around with the bully pulpit uh, of being <laughs> the official is that uh, you get to dictate what is um, what makes sense for manufacturers in terms of uh, not only oh, a base I, device. I, but... I totally agree with that. What I, what I worry about is with their position as being sort of the standards bearer is that I don't think I see... My personal opinion, a Microsoft which is really thinking about what that ecosystem in total should resemble. And this, to me, yeah. looks like they're trying think, something. Yeah, and that makes I, me super nervous because look at all of the things they've tried and sort of walked away from and sort of revisited and sort of walked away from, especially if anyone in our audience you know, knows that I used to be such a diehard Windows phone fan. Um this stuff is, these are the kinds of moves that give me pause, that, that make me concerned or apprehensive about buying into this ecosystem. And I don't necessarily have an answer to that. I'm just saying that it's, 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 a, it's a move that can, be, that can prove to be toxic uh, right. when it just it went left unaddressed. So that's all I have for that. <laughs> well, uh, lastly, I, I wanted to get I, I wanted to get your thoughts on McAfee too. I I, I just question the need for a, a, a dedicated protection piece of software on a mobile device. I just haven't seen the the actual reports on threats that this type of software would do a good job of actively defending against. No, it, it's free. You you get it for free. It's fine. You just just let it, let, oh, so let, just just use let, it. Just have it, it be on your phone because it's free. Yeah, just, it's right there. You can just <laughs> use it. You can. It's fine. Don't you don't have to touch it. Don't, don't even you think don't, about it. Don't think about it. In things. fact, I mean, I mean, you're just going to be disappointed when you hold the thing and then you re and then you can't get to the. You can't. You, there's no. There's no delete. It's just uh, information. You can't even disable the damn thing. So. Very, very well put, Jules. Well, we also have two additional news stories that um, were heavy hitters on PocketNow.com. So I, I think we should bring in a guest to help us unpack those stories. Uh, some some interesting conversation that I think we're, we can jump into there. 
Indeed, so uh, we'll get to that in just a second, but before we do, you can see full details on these stories and more. Hit pocketnow.com and look for the podcast section to get to this episode's rundown. Also, be sure to check out Jaime Rivera and the Pocket Now Daily on our YouTube channel. Bam. Yeah, two of these topics I really want to unpack, dig a little deeper, chat a little bit with some more nuance, and to help us unpack those new stories... Uh, we're in, we're bringing on the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Enabong Edda, uh, Thunder E from Board at Work. Thank you so much for joining us to chat about uh, the OnePlus 5 and Google Fuchsia. Thank you very much for having me, Mr. Juan Bagnell. It's always good to jump on the Pocket Now uh, podcast, so I am ready to chat away <laughs> yes let's let's chat away so first of all let, let's jump right into the one plus five i think this is going to be one of those topics that uh it would help if i had the right web page up this is going to be one of those topics that i think is going to have a lot of traction among android fans uh this is uh this is definitely a uh you know it's an enthusiast phone the one plus brand yeah. is always sort of represented that kind of enthusiast commentary. I'm going to pull your little window over there, and I'm going to get my face out of the way. <laughs> and perfect. So we've got these specs. We've got these leaks. Um, this could be that perfect melding of dual rear cameras, dual front cameras. Now, this has been a topic that we've been covering uh, sort of behind the scenes at Pocket Now. We're trying to figure out how we want to talk about this. But we've got this race for the premium end of the smartphone. We're waiting to see which manufacturer is going to deliver a $1,000 smartphone. And then on the flip side, we've got this insane competition from entry-level smartphones, from mid uh, premium mid-rangers. People always get super frustrated when I just say mid-rangers instead of premium mid-rangers. And uh, I wanted to get your take on some of these uh, some of these detailed drawings, you know, because we're just looking at some of the, uh, some of the, you know, the, it's almost like engineering sketches of what this phone could resemble. Um, is this walking in the right direction for a company like OnePlus, or should we be expecting more from a brand that's sort of built its rep on the no compromises, flagship killing smartphone? Um, I mean, first off, the sketches look wonderful. <clears throat> I have to compliment whoever did the sketches because, you know, if it was me, it would just be a rectangle. And then two circles. <laughs> right. I'd be like, do this, draw cameras. There you go. Exactly. Something like that. But I, you know what? I like it. I like the dual front cameras. Look, uh, dual red cameras are a, a constant now. I mean, Samsung is the only company who just doesn't have one. That's pretty much it. But they have a really good camera on their phone. So OnePlus 5 having a dual red camera, that I expected to see. The dual front facing camera, that could be something if, you know that could at least create, create some stare in the market, mm -hmm. especially with selfie fans and if they are trying to even expand some of the sensibilities of being just a niche device right. and trying to explore, maybe let's, let's be niche and let's also try and just get into one other segment. That could be it. Um, but in terms of design, it kind of looks like the LG G4 from the renders you know it's got it's got that curved back i the positioning of the cameras at the rear remind me of the g4 mm -hmm. in a sense uh even the front of the device looks like the g4 to me so uh hopefully it doesn't look that way and it still has that unique oneplus styling because uh even though i'm not the biggest fan of your design i do like that it's a little bit different from everyone else so uh yeah, that is something this this that that design note I think is is very uh, is very well put, um, mm -hmm. especially because I think in the past like I, I'm going through and I'm digging up one plus three T stuff. We're gonna be trying to do a few comparisons before the uh, one plus five launches, and putting that phone back in my hand, there's definitely that feeling or that sense of like old HTC, and especially on these engineering concept sketches, the bottom of the phone still to me very much resembles what we saw from say the HTC Ten right you know the, the yeah. way that the phone tapers and curves i think your point about where the cameras are located definitely seems to be inspired somewhat from maybe some of the work that lg has done in the past um and, and then also that notion of dual front facing cameras like i don't have we seen anything like that since the v10 i think the v10 was the only phone that i remember making a major commercial push with a separate wide angle selfie shooter 
Yeah, I think the V10 and LG didn't do a good job in marketing that. I think even OnePlus with its small base, but its loud social media presence can easily market that dual front facing camera. Yeah. You know, so I think I think that might be their play here this year where, you know, it's going to have an 835 processor in there. It's going to have 64 gigs of RAM or whichever variant. Maybe they will include micro SD this time. Who knows? I'm, I, I hope so. <laughs> right. uh, it's going to have all those things that you expect in a flagship device. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of what can they, you know, separate themselves this year. Right. Uh, it looks like, you know, uh, lifestyle features might not be in. We don't know whether it's be, you know, water resistance or wireless charging, maybe that, of course, it will just add too much money, you know, to the device. So I think that dual front facing camera might be where they will go to, to say, hey, this is something we're doing different. Here's something for uh, a different segment and also for our key fans also, you know, within the core Android space. Now you can take better selfies and uh, you can get better wide angle shots. You can right. also, you can also vlog better. I mean, you don't have to take selfies just with a front-facing camera, too. You, know, you can also do your vlogs and do video recordings and things like that. So uh, I think we'll just have to wait and see once this device comes out. The, the sad part about it is that, you know, spec-wise, every device is the same. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's the true sad part about 2017 with smartphones is right. LG G6, uh, other than the fact that the G6 runs an 821, but even that too, you're like, eh, whatever. Um, you know, the Samsung Galaxy uh, devices, whatever HTC comes out, OnePlus 5, all these devices will have very similar specs. The differences will lay in camera and the display. Being Samsung makes really great displays in their own. LG has good displays and everybody else is buying from either Samsung or LG. So. Right. <laughs> well, That's... let's unpack a few of these rumors real quick before we move on. I, I know in these concept sketches, they're, they're talking about maybe starting to incorporate ceramic. So this would be a two-panel rear body, very similar to what we saw on the Pixel, but instead of glass, there would be a different feel up around the camera module, maybe to help improve radio reception. I doubt that we'd want to put... I doubt they'd be able to put charging coils <laughs> directly underneath the cameras if the uh, the ceramic panel is that small. But do you think that material choice could help be a distinguishing factor, or do you think that that's too subtle a design change to get consumers interested? You know, like right now it seems like if it's pretty and it's glass, then people think it's nifty. Outside of that, no one really seems to have moved the needle on using different materials. You see, I, I don't know when it comes to OnePlus because, you know, the core audience is a, is a hardcore Android audience. So you throw ceramic, the first thing they call out is, oh, wow, you know, you're copying Google. So, what, you know, it's, it's, it's a, what's the name of the Google device? I just forgot it. Jesus. You mean the Pixel? Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I was about to say Nexus. I'm like, no, no, that's not it. That's not it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a Pixel, you know, and... I'm not sure how that will play within, you know, that, that community itself, right. if they are willing to accept it as something different from them or, you know, accompanying the Nexus and, you know, how that also affects its comparison to the Galaxy S8, because it's going to be compared to that device no matter what, or the LG G6. Right. So, you know, for me, I think with a company like OnePlus, also cost-wise, why even bother? I think you, I think you should either have a solid design and work on the materials they usually work with mm -hmm. and then add features that would give you an exponential boost then you know that little piece of ceramic that i don't think it does much right. in terms of expanding their base well and, and also it makes me concerned because i i, I think ceramics are going to be that that bleeding edge kind of design material are we worried about a material that's potentially more brittle than aluminum? Um, will it be as durable as glass? I, I can already see the gadget destruction porn from people that are going to make conclusions off of dropping one phone over and over and over again. You're like, well, I dropped it six times from waist height, and then when I dropped it from, from ear height, it completely shattered. And you're like, well, yeah, because you've been breaking this phone multiple times over and over and over again. Um, I, I, I just want to circle back real quick. Do you think that lifestyle features on a phone that's probably going to be sub $500, I would imagine OnePlus is going to try and continue playing under that threshold. 
uh, you know, if we don't get word on enhanced drop resistance or we don't get word on enhanced water resistance, do you think that that's going to be something that carries over into the enthusiast base? Like uh, OnePlus fans, do you think that that's going to affect a purchasing decision? Or do you think that those people are probably more focused on a quad HD display with a Qualcomm 835? Yeah, I agree. I think that people are, are focused on the Quad HD display and 835. The lifestyle features, you know, I, I think just going from my reaction, a lot of people are like, yeah, you know, my OnePlus 3T is almost as good as my Galaxy S8. The only difference is the Galaxy S8 has water resistance and wireless charging. I don't need that. You know, right. that, that audience is always adamant about that kind of stuff. And I think even for OnePlus, the cost of putting that and the fact that they haven't done it before so mm -hmm. i'm not even sure how good they will be with first implementation in terms of issues and things like that i think it's one of those areas where there's no need to the closest thing you might get would be durability testing that i think it's something that is more attractive for right. that core core base where they can say okay yeah you know, you can drop your Galaxy S8, I can drop my OnePlus, it doesn't crack. You know, that is something <laughs> right. <laughs> something that you get that people will say that people would at least accept more as a lifestyle feature to, you know, where if it's five hundred dollars, they still would be okay with that, with that extra fifty dollar uh, price jump. Yeah, I'll be really curious to see how some of these things play out because you know, OnePlus got us to sixty four gigabytes of storage as sort of a standard, <laughs> though they did it at the same time by not allowing micro SD card expansion. Um, one of the things I actually thought was kind of frustrating on the OnePlus 3T because you had a dual SIM phone, you know, like yeah. you had two, two card slots and they just didn't want to put in the combo slot, which could have been either a micro SD card or a dual SIM. Though I still have to question people outside of the, the rabid enthusiast community, the, the sort of hardcore smartphone fans, <laughs> I know so many friends and family who just never bother using something like a micro SD card. Like I I'm even kind of debating with my wife because her Galaxy S7 is full and she's playing with Amazon photo storage and OneDrive and Google Photos. She's doing all of this cloud backup and she's still full on the phone and sort of reticent to add another piece of hardware like a memory card just to offload some of that stuff from the internal storage. Uh, th th as the, that last talking point for a company like OnePlus, do you think we've all moved on? Do we think the cloud is robust enough for consumers out there? Or is it just sort of the general ignorance or apathy? Like, I didn't put the card in when I first got the phone, so now I'm just going to use the phone exactly how it came out of the box. Uh, you are right on both, <laughs> both <laughs> accounts. Um, I, I think the first thing is... Yes, I didn't put that SD card in there, so you know I'm not bothered to do it anymore. And it's easy for me to download an app and go between because we look at apps faster than we look at hardware. Right. You know that's that's the state of affairs. the The other problem too is that transferring content from SD card is still not easy. Until until SD transfer is as easy as switching between two hard drives on a PC, mm -hmm. then that will be the point where you know people will care but at this point cloud storage is where everyone's going to so i think i think oneplus has has ridden that wave right long enough where you know if they offer a 64 and a 128 then people will just i'll just get the 128 and i'm done yeah <laughs> you know that's well, that's, it, that's what isn't it is. that something that that apple has sort of helped and i'm using like air quotes helped educate consumers that you just want the one with more gbs right you know that outside of that you shouldn't have to think about managing the hardware of your phone until it's time to buy a new phone yeah i agree apple has done that quite effectively over the last uh what eight years or how long they've had the iphone sorry uh nine years this would be ten uh they've done that quite effectively you know apple users are unknown for complaining about 16 gigabytes of storage and looking for ways to try to offload it till you know uh, iCloud showed up. Uh, so OnePlus, I think, has taken that to the advantage by at least upping the amount of basic storage you have in your device and using that as a way to say, hey, look, you need 64 gigabytes. You don't need that much, right. at least now. Or you could go to 128. So I think they're fine because you know with the way things are, cloud storage is is good enough where you have you know options between. 
uh, OneDrive, you have Google Cloud, um, yeah, Google Cloud, and as well Dropbox. So you can, you know, you can manage with all three to dispose of your excess photos. Now, uh, just to just to wrap up, OnePlus Five as a, as sort of a fan of Android, what would you want to see this company push forward for their new initiative? I mean, like I said at the top of this, we're seeing an intense squeeze from the lower and mid ranger phones. And I think there is a growing consumer sentiment for what is it that I'm really getting when I'm throwing down seven, eight, nine hundred dollars? Like if you account for sales tax in California, the Galaxy S8 Plus is almost a thousand dollar phone out the door. Um, what what would you want to see OnePlus move as a company? Not necessarily just what what tech is built into their phone, but OnePlus as a company. What do you think their next move should be to try and shake up this conversation? Uh, better marketing. We've said this before <laughs> over the last couple of years. I think I think OnePlus is at a very distinct advantageous position. Uh, they're the company who they have the history of saying, "Hey, we've built premium at mid-range price, you know, and we have premium for you." But the problem is they've not gotten this message past core audiences. Right. So, in, to a certain degree, maybe ceramic is part of that message. Where yes. It's an aesthetic feature, but when you're marketing and advertising, you can now showcase to people that here is something that's really premium and it's only you know some five hundred dollars. Right. Uh, so I think I think if they can come up with a at this this is the fourth OnePlus device, or actually fifth OnePlus device. <laughs> Everyone wants to forget the OnePlus X except for people who owned the OnePlus X. No, I was I wasn't even counting the OnePlus X. I was counting OnePlus One, Two, Three, Three T, and then Five. This would be five devices. X doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we should say five flagship devices. Yeah, devices, I've already gotten. Yes. You know what? There's just the fact that you said that. I've already. I know. I've already gotten angry comments from people who <laughs> 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 are rocking the OnePlus X. Exactly. Uh, but but they they have that history. They've created something, and they've spent you know four years doing this. It's about time you grow up. Yeah. It's about time that your marketing changes. You know, and you've talked about this in the past of saying, look, it takes at least three years for a company to get the right product. And that was the OnePlus 3 and 3T. Yeah. You know, that was, that's the point where OnePlus was, we were like, yeah, now you've gotten there. Well, and as so a company we, growing up significantly, because that was also the first time they didn't do this like pre-order lottery system thing or yeah. uh, like hold your place in line with a ticket kind of uh, shenanigans and they actually just had a regular proper pre-order system um, what what do you do you think that the next step on that is uh, I mean so marketing has definitely got to be a part of that equation but do you think this is a company that could maybe start fulfilling orders for some kind of carrier tie-in because I think one uh, of the issues with OnePlus is you know we saw so many people were on back order with the OnePlus 3 that then they kind of just got rolled into the OnePlus 3T when they shifted over and they stopped making the 3. Um, I, my, my fear is, like, could this company push too aggressively and then not actually be able to deliver on the hardware that they're trying to produce? If I am OnePlus, I think my marketing strategy will be very simple. And looking one is looking for a carrier partner in the U.S. Right. And I... I say go to T-Mobile. T-Mobile is always happy to throw some kind of wrench in, into the bucket. Yeah. Uh, so I think if you can get T-Mobile on the line, I think what you want to do as OnePlus is you want to come out and you want to be clear. You know how much you can manufacture. I mean, I think you, you want to, if, if I am them, you know, play the blue ocean approach, change the game and say, hey, look, we're still a small company, but we like to deliver the best. And right. you can spin it a little bit and say, because of manufacturing, because we want to deliver the best, we have batches of units. And this is this is what we're doing. Whether it's 100,000 or 500,000 for a fast batch, that is what you have. Please place orders. And once it's filled up, we'll let you know in the next batch. Is, and hopefully it's within a, you give them a time frame. Right. And then if you do that for three months, then you kick off with your partnership with T-Mobile. At that time, you should easily you know, fulfilled all your orders. Mm -hmm. And then you use T-Mobile as your second push. That goes into three months would be September, holiday season. Right. I mean, no, not holiday season, back to school season. You know, then you can now mix in with that crowd of saying, hey, 
If you don't want to get an iPhone, you can get a OnePlus. If you don't want to get a Galaxy Note, this is something you can get off T-Mobile for, right. f- you know, fifteen dollars a month. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that that you know the the T-Mobile partnership, OnePlus as a hardware company, just feels like they would be very much akin to an uncarrier sort of mentality, right? The, we're trying to shake yeah. things up. We're trying to to buck trends. We're trying to. Uh, to move the needle on how you buy your phone and what you should be looking for. So um, I, I know we're, we're kind of running up on uh, just a, a little extra time here because I know you have to get going. But I wanted to spend a little time talking about your thoughts on Google Fuchsia. Uh, so we got a sneak peek at some of the developer stuff for what uh, could be potentially, maybe, I don't know, Google's next uh, operating system. And uh, I don't know, have you had a chance to look through some of the stuff that, that's leaked out? I, I just saw the video before we started uh, taking a look at it. It's card-based. I kind of skipped through. I wasn't impressed, but then again, it's early. Uh, that's just my first impressions. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I saw the card-based system. I'm not a fan of card-based systems right now, right. Uh, even with Google, uh, Google Now and some of the stuff with Bigsby I've been using. Uh, it, it just kind of annoys me. I don't know why. Like, I, I, I like the desktop. I want to see my wallpaper, so I don't want to have a old... Yeah, but we're all <laughs> old and, and, like, set in our ways, and, oh, I just want to go back to Windows 3. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, no, I'm not old. I mean, look, let's be frank, okay? People ask me for my wallpaper, so I I guess the, a lot of people like me out there who want it. I, 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 like, I, I get the idea of the cards. Right. My problem is is I, I, I'm not sure. So now, is this going to work? I This is what I, I'm thinking. I'm going for Armadillo. Oh, is, is that what it is, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, Armadillo, to me, should have been the next progression of Google Now. Gotcha. Uh, because unless the card system works hand-in-hand hand together with it, because I think the next the next jump in mobile operating system is voice. Mm -hmm. And I think that needs to improve drastically where, you know, you know, not just the fact that you're driving the car, but the fact that, you know, if I have an earpiece or a smartwatch and I'm giving commands, I'm getting information back. Like, I think we're at that point where we can get some of those uh, functionalities from the movie Her in our smartphones at this point. Totally. I don't say all of it, but some of that. So I would like to see more of that than just see cards. And I hopefully the cards are tied together with that. Then I would be more impressed. But since there was no audio, we didn't know exactly what this is. Right. I'm still very unsure of where they're going with this. Uh, I think aesthetically at this point, if you just throw out a card-based system OS, people would hate it. Just, I think, now at this present point in time. Yeah, it definitely, for me, I mean, looking at what they're trying to do design-wise, certainly runs up against that problem that we've talked about, especially on your show, on on your podcast, that consumers want something new and exciting and fresh and different so long as it looks and feels and does exactly what they're used to. (laughs) Yes. Right? And so I'm looking at what some, some of these really interesting design concepts on Fuchsia and... First of all, the first thing I think is, okay, this this looks like it needs to be a Chrome OS replacement. I, I, I think okay, there you go. There that you looks go. that looks very obvious, especially they're trying to show off like multi-panel, uh, you know, four panels of information up on one screen at a time. And it's sort of a more three by two aspect ratio, less a phone aspect ratio. But one of the things that I think is really compelling is um, the notion of Google changing the underpinnings of Android or Chrome OS, the core architecture that lives underneath. And so obviously this is super fresh. This, I mean, not super fresh. This is super raw. Uh, This could be a project that has legs. It could be something which we know Google loves to just cancel. You know, like, ah, we don't love it anymore, so we're just going to kill it. But do you think that this is this is the right time that we're taking those baby strategies towards walking away from Linux as the kernel underneath Android, um, going to completely Google uh, designed underpinnings, Google uh, design and developer code bases, languages. Um, Is this what we need for the next evolution of Android? Or do you think Android can continue in its current state 
of uh, of development. I mean, Android can. It's Linux. Linux is goddamn flexible, man. You can do anything with it. it so it's, on that aspect, it can. It's what Google wants to do. That's the right. thing. I mean, also there's the lawsuits and you know getting away from that. I, I understand right. that as, as as a company. I think with Armadillo, though, I've, you're right saying that Chrome OS, yes, I can see that going into Chrome OS um, and being something on that aspect or platform, or even maybe even a tablet of some sort. Yeah. Um, uh, on a smartphone, not so much because, again, the visual representation, because what, the, what I think Google will be fighting is not just people say, I don't like this, mm -hmm. but you're also fighting... Um, the representations from your two biggest competitors. Right. One is called Samsung and one is called Apple. And Samsung is not going to change this anytime soon to look like. They may use the same underneath uh, kernel, but they are not changing to look like a bunch of cards flowing on the screen. Mm -hmm. And Apple is still the way it is. I iOS is not changing anytime soon. So you're going to have that fight where people, now, like you said, you know, people are going to go, okay, you know, there'll be some of us who go, this is great. It's really fast. It works well. You can do 150 things at once. And everybody goes, <laughs> it's a bunch of gray and white cards. Why right. should I care? I mean, I'm not, like, I'm, not, I'm not in college anymore. I don't yeah. have like, you know, you know, flip notes to, to go through. So, I, I, you know, like I said, if it's tied to, it is tied to voice, I can see where they're th trying to go with it. But again, you don't need to have a card system to have it tied to voice to do anything. Uh, functional for you. So to me, that is just more a repository of where all the information that you just asked for can be housed, which is great on one side of your screen. Right. So I'm, I'm not sure where this will go. Um, I'm not sure what Google will do. And knowing Google very well, you know, there is a, I'll give it a 65% chance that it might be canned. You know, <laughs> it has a higher probability of being canned than, you know, then working or but at least there will probably be something in there that they will use in future projects i would say on that yeah. level they, there's there's gonna be something they can take out of it uh but the way it looks now and what i'm seeing i just don't see the consumer base going for it because as you said people want something new and fresh that still looks old yeah well and and is familiar I, this is the thing that always bugs me is like let's say google makes the most intuitive air quotes intuitive os ever made just the fact that it's unfamiliar means someone's going to play with it for a minute and go oh I, it's, I can't use it i don't understand how it works it's no it's no good and then they'll put it aside and then they'll go back to what they're already currently using um your point about the lawsuits i think is is a really compelling one for a company where google's at as a company or alphabet's at as a company um, getting away from any software which could potentially step on another company's toes, like Oracle, the number of, of uh, appeals that that lawsuit has currently gone through. And then also this notion of having more control over the kernel. Um, the kernel of the, of the underpinnings of this OS not being quite in Google's control means that they've run into some problems with some of their future updates versus the control that companies like Qualcomm have over this mobility space. So that, mm -hmm. you know, we were just recently talking, you know, like a phone like the OnePlus X, what was that, the Qualcomm 801 or 805? I can't remember. I um, think it's the 805. I think, you're right. I, think, I think you're right. I think it was the 805, and someone will correct me in the comments because I'm probably talking crap. But regardless, anything before the 808 or the 810 is sort of now dead for future major updates. You know, they can't yeah. move that phone up into future, uh, you know, more current versions. I shouldn't even say future. Current versions of the Android operating system. Uh, there are some security uh, issues with the current relationship between this, the, the kernel that's used for Android, where Google's at in development. And again, the chipsets that a lot of these older phones are still running. I mean, like the number of of Galaxy S3s and Galaxy S4s out in the uh, smartphone ecosystem are, are still staggering. Um, so if Google had control over that, uh, over that kernel, over that, over that hardware, uh, the hardware and software, I mean, wouldn't that give Google a bit more synergy for future fixes, for uh, future updates, and hopefully our devices last a little bit longer if it's a it, what, what's, what's ridiculous is that what I'm what I'm suggesting here is Google moving to a more closed ecosystem, 
they can still put a bunch of stuff out as as open source, but they would be the ones sort of building the little garden around this kernel as opposed to using some of the accepted standards that Android currently utilizes. Uh, uh, yeah, I do agree, but then it becomes iOS. That's just it. I mean, it's a closed right. box. So, I mean, that's what they have to face and that's what they have to deal with where um, not trying to, okay, I'm not trying to bring Microsoft into this, but <laughs> you know, Microsoft currently has build going on this week. Right. And they talked about how you can build iOS apps using Windows. And even Microsoft has gone away from being, uh, Microsoft has gone through changes. They went from being very open, a little mm -hmm. bit closed. Now they're going back to being a little bit more open again because, you know, they have partnerships with uh, Linux. They have decided to deal with Linux to, to solve that issue. And to me, Google can do the same thing. You know, you can solve this problem and also create an ecosystem for yourself. Uh, but if you want to totally build all the way through, developers will still come back because they have to, because yeah. it's the second biggest operating system out there. Actually, technically it is the biggest because yeah. they have more devices running on there. So um, they, they will definitely come back to, to, um, to Android, but there'll be a lot of you know complaining, people will be angry and <laughs> yeah. things like that. So that's something that they have to actually look at to see is it, is it which is more viable in the long term which will cause less headaches um sending the lawsuit a few years ago would have caused less headaches but hey companies like to fight with lawyers so. well and and i think what's kind of interesting is who would this cause more headaches for versus who would it solve headaches for so you know if someone's out there and they're a really passionate member of like xda developers and they love cutting custom roms you know, Google sort of closing off the future of their operating systems with something like Fuchsia certainly throws a wrench in what they might be able to do. I mean, potentially, hypothetically. I, Google yeah. could also surprise us and make it ridiculously easy to get in there using their languages to develop ROMs. I doubt that would happen. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, I see, I think, but the I flip think side, Google... oh, sorry, sorry, real sorry, quick, but ahead, the flip yeah. side to that would be Everyone else who sort of languishes with this relationship of Google to manufacturer to carrier might see just a little bit of an abbreviation for how updates, bug fixes, patches, security problems are rectified. And so are, are, are we is it time to maybe have that conversation where for the greater good um, that we start closing down Android, we start closing down Chrome? to potentially better service the vast majority of people. And unfortunately, that just means enthusiasts and the, the techier members of our respective audiences kind of get the shaft again. Okay, I, I'm not really, I'm not quite va uh, versed in, in how open or closed Android is. Uh, I always compare everything to Windows because Windows has right. been the most open totally. operating system out there. And Windows has done a very good job in clamping down. Remember, Windows had a, a virus problem. That was, you know, it was, it was like the plague. You know, every, <laughs> every month there was a new virus and Microsoft took steps into handling that where, you know, Windows is more secure than iOS. I'm not iOS, uh, Mac OS, at least as of last year, it could change this year, who knows, uh, in terms of when it comes to virus attacks and things like that. Um, but Google could probably take some of the same steps that Microsoft did. I don't know exactly how, right. but to your other point, I do think, yes, for the greater good, it does make sense for a company, like if you're looking from the company perspective, they have to do that. The people who also complain are developers. Developers yeah. are lazy. That is the general theme. If you're a developer <laughs> listening to this, I didn't call you lazy. I'm just saying this is what everybody else says. So right. except Balmer. That, Balmer was developers, 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 developers. developers. Yeah, yeah. That's that's your guy right there. But developers. But I mean, even if I was a developer, I don't want to switch from Linux where I've built all this stuff and then have to move over. Yes, right. there are tools. And we saw that with Microsoft with uh, uh, Windows Phone, where they had some really awesome tools that they, all they said is you throw your app in there, you click a button, and then it transfers over. And yeah, that was Windows Phone, but it's, it's, you're still going to get a level of gripe right. from people. You know, well, and we saw so. something similar with Apple when they switched, when they had like Coco and developers yeah. waited until proper legacy support had just been removed before they really did shift programs over to that new, that new code language. So I think this will be really interesting because I think something needs to start changing 
Though it really seems like all of the companies that are responsible for our mobile gadgets are playing very conservative. You know, we get a little kind of a, a graphics update here, slightly better battery life there, and no one's looking to rock the boat too se severely on like UI or the underpinnings of the architecture or what the next generation, because you know, like Google is also trying at the same time to front web apps again. You know, sort of, uh, what is it called? Persistent web apps? Something like yeah. that? Where, you, like, little bits of code are installed on your phone, but it's not like you really install Yelp. You just get the benefits of some of Yelp's underpinnings while you're online at the same time. So something, obviously, is brewing. It's yeah, just I where we I, end up. I think, I think no one's sure where to go. I think that is probably what it is. Right. Um, I, I think a lot of people are trying different things. Uh, Microsoft, in a way, is actually safe because they're no longer in the mobile space, and, <laughs> which is sadly, surprising. Sad. Yeah. Sad, sadly, you know, so they can go with a very structured approach to advancing forward. And with you know, with some of the things they announce and build, I can see them moving more to voice yeah. and less with this, as opposed to Google, where Google is in the state where they can move to voice quite easily, but uh, they also need to make changes to the core operating system itself right. at the same time. So I think we're, we're in a situation where a lot of people will play it safe for maybe another two, three years, where we get to the year, you know, um, you know, like 2012. Did I say 2012? Sorry. You did. Wow. Well, that's when, yeah. the, that's, when, that's when the world's going to end. So actually, that's a perfect I, time to... I, I, I don't even know why. go back in time to, and... <laughs> 2012. Wow. You mean 2020? <laughs> that was good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. My brain time traveled back to 2012. Yeah, oh, we were happier days back then. Good <laughs> yeah. old 2012. But, but yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> uh, 20, 2020 will be probably the time where you see companies, you know, because... It's also, you know, we're going to higher digit numbers in, in, our, in our calendar where companies will start going, you know, this is past most science fiction movies yeah. and things like that. So now we have to give you something that kind of matches your curiosity. You know, I, I sit down here waiting for my Starship Enterprise. I don't have it yet. So. Right. I mean, yeah. I, like, you know, I've got these awesome smartphones, but I don't have my tricorder yet. That's that's clown shoes. Well, yeah. um, uh, I, I know you've got to get going. I've kept you a little longer than we intended, but thank you so much for jumping in and helping us kind of chew through some of this info. There are two of the, the bigger stories on Pocket Now this week, and so there's definitely some anticipation and some excitement about what, uh, what Google and what OnePlus might have coming down the pipe. Um, where can people catch your coverage, your content uh, around the web, the Twitters, the YouTubes, the websites? Yeah, it's very simple. Um... It's boardatwork.com, spelled with two O's in the board section. And you can find the website, boardatwork.com. You can follow me on YouTube. It's also boardatwork. And then on Twitter, boardatwork. Instagram is boardatwork as well. So it's very simple. Same name across the board. And you're also covering some some gaming and TV content, uh, doing your reviews and your reaction videos. Yes, yes, yes. Um, thank you for reminding me of that. I, I just came. I just came back from a trip, so I'm, I'm a little bit worn out. But I do have. <laughs> no, you got a uh, full plate today, so I was happy you could work us in. I, I do have a, uh, a YouTube channel where we do a lot of uh, uh, comic book TV show reviews and reaction. It's called On Board. O N, and of course, Board, as you would expect. And then we have a gaming channel called Board Gamers, where we do uh, some gameplay reviews and things like that for gaming. So check us out on all of those. Yes, please check him out on all of those networks. Also, his weekly podcast, of which I'm a I'm a regular guest, and I really enjoy that that long form conversation. So, when you're done with the Pocket Now Weekly, of course, then go check out the Board at Work Weekly podcast, and you can get your weekly fix in two flavors <laughs> for all of your tech news. Thanks so much for joining us, man. Um, I'll, I'll be joining you on Saturday, so we can continue the conversation then. Yes, thank you very much, and uh, yeah, thank you. I said thank you again. Damn it. <laughs> oh, that's staying. That's staying in the podcast. <laughs> I always love having Anna Bong on these shows. He's he's one of my favorite cats to talk to about this kind of stuff. There you have it, folks. Another episode of the Pocket Now Weekly has come and gone. This show is over, but the conversation continues on Twitter, where you can find Anna Bong again as at Board at Work. Jules is at Point Jules, and I'm humbly 
at some gadget guy. Pocket Now is around the web, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google Plus, YouTube, and our home site, pocketnow.com. Now, shows like this cannot exist without your support. Sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology and by dropping reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever podcast reviews can be left. Because ultimately, there wouldn't be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012. The Pocket Now Weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness, so make sure you tune back in.